to Brahma Talks. I'm Leora Tech, um, and we're happy to welcome you to our 12th Brahma Talks. It's hard to believe that we've been doing this for a year, but we started in July 2020. Uh, Brahma Talks is a monthly webinar series about Jewish Lublin and about Brahma Grotska Teater NN, which is the sponsor of Brahma Talks. Um, if this is your first time, let me tell you just a, a, a few words about what Brahma Grotska Teater NN is. It is a municipal institution in Lublin, Poland, who is committed to preserving the memory of the 43,000 Jews who lived in Lublin before World War II. Um, and I'm very excited that today we have one of those people with us. Our meeting is um, usually an hour, but today we're going to take an hour and 15 minutes. So we'll have about an hour of conversation and then 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, and I want to invite you um, to say hello to each other in the chat. You can say where you're from um, and use the Q&A tab for any questions that you have. You can put questions in there throughout the meeting, but we'll address them at the end. OK, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest for today, who is here with me, Rose Lipschitz. And um, you're all going to love Rose. Um, she's an amazing person. Um, Rose was born in Lublin in 1929. She's a Holocaust survivor. She lost over 50 members of her family in the Holocaust. And what's amazing to me, well, many things about you, Rose, are amazing to me, but one of them is this positive attitude that you have about human nature. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to you having the opportunity to share some of that and some of your wisdom with our audience. So um, I know that you were born in a very special place, which is Grotska Street, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to show the picture of that building because we, um, those of you who don't know, it's Brahma Grotska, the institution that sponsors this talk, is right almost across the street from this building where Rose grew up. So tell us a little bit, Rose, about your childhood. Oh, my childhood, Grotska. Most I remember about the city of Lublin and the times, are the sound. I still remember it, hear it in my ear, the sound of the horses and the, and the small wagons, exactly. They called it the Roshka in Polish going down the cobblestone street. You see, Grotska Street was a street, two, two large sidewalks, and the road was made out of cobblestones. And I think... I, yes, I lived on Grotska 30 with my mother, father, and two brothers, my older brother and my younger brother. And I think I have a picture of that as well. Yeah, well, that's a famous hotel now. That's that that building. Oh, that that is my family: my father, my mother, my older brother, and my little brother, which was the love of my life. Mm -hmm. I I mourned him more than I mourned anybody else. Until my son was born, the pain was always there. I think my son took his place. Okay. Rose, can you tell us some of your early? Because it's so it's so precious for us to hear these these pre-war yes. memories of Lublin. Well, Grotska Street was my childhood domain. Actually, I used to hopscotch, and I had friends next door. I don't know their second names, but one was Pasha Pesha, and one was Luba, and one was Hana. And we played hopscotch, but it was a whole street because the whole area consisted of Jewish children. And there was this orphanage across the street that sometimes they came out to play. Oh, it was, it was my domain. And most of all, and the most important place was the Grotska Gate, where there is where there is the museum on one side, there used to be an old man with a white beard selling goodies, and me being a 
tremendously junk eater. I spent every gross I had on my candies. I think I must have been his best customer. <laughs> and then on the other side of Grotzka Gate was the Jewish area. It looks so much different now when I saw it. Now it's a parking lot. But this was more of a hill with, 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 stone, with cobblestones. And I remember the women sitting on a hot coal in the winter to keep themselves warm and selling little bubalach with butter. I don't exactly know, remember what it was made of, but it was little pots they were selling it. And they used to cut it open and put a little butter in it. Oh my God, I used to run there. <laughs> and I remember Lubartoska Street because my aunt had a bakery there. I think it was the best bakery in the city, the Tuller Bakery. I used to run there for my goodies. And then there was Ribna Street where my grandmother had a, a store, a grocery store. You know, she was widowed at, this, at the 48 and eight children. She surely had to make a living, couldn't read or write, but opened a grocery store. Oh, and I did extremely well. I think we have a picture of her. Oh, this is my maternal grandmother and eight of her children. Only two survived. One that was with me during the war, and one that wound up in Siberia, where we never thought we were gonna see it alive again. But I remember my grandmother crying when they sent her away to Siberia. I will never see my daughter again. Little did she know that her daughter is the one that's gonna come back, but she won't survive. Wow. That was done in 38 in the woods of Osmolitsa. We used to go there every year in the summer for vacation because my grandmother Kate was born there. And that was a small, like a town in the Lubin region, right? Or a village? small little town, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, then there was the school that I attended, which was behind the large church that shows on Krolevska Street. Behind yeah. there was the school. I really don't know. Uh, it, when I came after the war, it wasn't a school anymore. But when I, and then there was the Ricino Rialto. Oh my God, I used to run to see, uh, must have been Shirley Temple, I remember. <laughs> and oh my God, I remember a few of the things. Well, you know, the, the, the friends that I have that lived on Grotzka Street, one had, I had a friend was Shoshana. Her father was a teacher in a Hebrew school, but I know I don't know their second name. And and there were two girls that they had a baker on Kowalska Street. They were my best friends. And then there were the the children from the or the up the street was was my little cousin, my two little cousins that did not, oh, you have a family from the old, the children, can you show it? Can you show the picture? Yeah, definitely. Um. Oh, yes, there were four more children born and only one I am that survived from all those children. And that's only from my mother's side. How about my father's side? Nobody survived from my father's side. So mm -hmm. I am the only one here. And my Aunt Rose that was with me and my Aunt Bella that was in Russia. The rest all perished. That little cousin of mine lived on Grotzka Street too. Oh my God. Rose, and can you tell us? I'm, yeah. Do you remember anything about what school was like? Well, it was... Uh, should I admit it? I was quite a little wild little girl. <laughs> and and the school, it was fun for me because I could always make everything into fun. I was kind of, but then came the war and all oh, my beautiful child ended. What happened? How did you first find out? I mean, was it on September 1st, 1939? Well, Interesting enough, you asked that question, because as we were driving back, I told you every summer we used to go to the country there. My mother, my father used to stay and come for the weekends, but I, 
we went to the country. And in 1939, the day that the war broke out, we were driving the, the carriage with all our goods back to Lublin. And people were meeting us on the road and saying, where are you going? There is a war. It's better in the country. That's wow. what I remember. And the first, was it the first Saturday they, they bombed Lublin? And then the second Saturday they bombed Lublin. And Lublin was on fire. All my, my childhood dreams were gone. I, I have to say something. My mother, oh, I, I can still say it later. My mother was a housewife and my father was a tailor. Well, if you would call it at the time, we must have been middle, middle class. But for today, I think we were poor. Uh -huh. Because I remember before the war, we used to, a lot of people used to come down to our apartment from the building that I lived to talk about politics, what was happening in Germany. And I listened on, I remember, I don't know how much I understood how horrible it was. But my mother used to say, if I only had enough money, I would run and go maybe, at the time, Argentina let Jewish people in if they were tailors. Uh -huh. But we didn't have the money to do that. And we were three children, so that was it. So when did you, I know at a certain point, you, you had to leave Lublin, the city. Well, that, that's when, but I just want to tell you one thing, what kind of human being my mother was and my father. In 1939, I developed scarlet fever. And in those years, they put you to bed for six weeks. There was no penicillin to help you. So my father made it a point every night to sit and read to me Sholem Aleichem books. He took it, he took the time for it. And my mother, one day in the fall of 1939, before the winter fell, they brought a group of Jewish people and they threw them on Lubatoska. There was a small little marketplace and they threw them in the middle of the night, in the middle of the winter. They just put them there. And my mother heard it and she went down and picked up a family, a husband, wife, and a little girl. And they stayed with us until we were allowed to stay on Grotzka Street. But once they, they started doing the, I think the ghetto, I'm not 100% sure. Excuse me. So we when they opened, when they started doing, they putting together together, they made us get out. They didn't allow us to live in, 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 in our place anymore. So where are we going to go? We went to Osmolitsa because that's where my grandmother came from. And that's where we used to go every summer. And my mother had some cousins living there. So when we went there, the cousin had a little house, but they were four people themselves. And they had two rooms, so they couldn't share it with us. But I had a shack in the back. So they allowed us to stay in that shack. But be, the winters being as they cold as they were, we put sticks around the shacks and leaves in between to keep us warm. And that's where we spent the next year and a half or whatever till, 19, till October 1942. My father stayed in the ghetto for a while to work, to be able to support us. And I, one time my mother sent me with food to bring it to him. And I walked through Dombrova woods. I don't know if you ever went through there. No, no. because by train. Dombrova yeah. was eight kilometers of woods. And as wow. I was coming back, when I left the foot with my father, I was coming back. I wound up in the middle of the night in those woods. My God, was I, I couldn't have been more than 11 years old, or maybe not even. And I was crying, and I was running through those woods. And then a farmer came by with a full buggy with hay and put me on top of this hay and brought me to Osmolitsa. Oh, wow. What an experience that was. <laughs> While we were in Osmolitsa, we the only way we could live, eat, 
as by working for, I, I know I know you realize that there was a feudalistic system still in Poland in those years. They were the very, very wealthy farmers and the very, very poor ones that worked for them. So Osmolica had one and and be uh, 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 Osmolica and Jabi Bola was the truth, the other one. So we went to work to pick the beets in the fall, sugar beets. And we was, used that, to, was that very difficult for a child to do this? Sure thing? it was. My little brother was pulling it with us and my older brother. But I remember one time as we were walking from the field, from the day's work, my mother looked at me and she said, oh my God, such a beautiful world, but it doesn't seem to be a place for us. I remember that was the most frightening moment of my life, I think. Yeah. She made that statement. Such a beautiful world, a no place for us. So, we, but at least we weren't exposed to the Germans on a daily basis because it was a small village. And we used to go sell a lot of the goodies that my aunt, the one that ran away to Russia, still had linen so we could sell it to farmers and eat, being honest. But I forgot to mention that in 1939, when Russia took half of Poland and Germany took the other half, my mother's brothers and my two sisters, actually my young Rose too, went to the other side. That's where she was cut and sent to Siberia. From there, from the Russian side. But in 1941, when Germany invaded Russia, my uncles all came back and my Aunt Rose all came back and they all perished, my uncles. If they would have been caught and sent to Siberia, they might have lived. You see, you never know, right, in life, what's yeah. good. Yeah. So they, they came to Osmolitz with us. Uh, my grandmother knew a family, Ablonski, which were living in Novini, closer to the train station. To me, a non-Jewish non family. Yes, Stanislav and Maria Jablonska. I think that my grandmother knew Maria well because Maria was born in Osmolitz too. And so was my grandmother, you see. So we used to go there and I used to play with, he had three children, I used to play with them in the field. So I knew them, you see. They were always kind people. So when in 1945, where just before, just on the Jewish holiday, and I remember listening, I always forget to bring that little poem that my daughter, my one of my daughters wrote about how people were praying and begging God to forgive us our sin and help us, but nobody heard us. Maybe just one of a child that I, only me that I survived. They, they, after the Jewish holiday, October, middle of October, they gave an order that we should all go to Belzitsa, a small little town, not far. This is 1942. October 1942. Mm -hmm. well, well, my uncles ran to Lublin because Lublin Although the ghetto was liquidated in 1943 in March, right? In 42 in March, mm -hmm. was the ghetto liquidated. They made another little ghetto in uh, Majdanek Tatarski, they called it. There was another ghetto in Lublin. Mm -hmm. So all my uncles and my grandma, I don't know, everybody ran. Nobody knew where to go. A lot of them went back to Lublin to try to get into that other ghetto. But my parents and my two brothers, we went to Belgium. We slept one night in a storefront with so many families. I think all five of us slept in one bed. And the next morning came a knock on the door, rouse, and they took us on this marketplace in Belgica. I visited it recently. Mm -hmm. When we did the documentary, I'll talk about it later. 
And there they started dividing the people, men and women without children to one side and, and women and children to the other side. They took my father away. Natrok, I think. I never even said goodbye to him. I thought they took him to Maidanek, but I'm not really sure where he perished. And us, the rest of us, they started walking us on the road to the train station, which might have been about quite a ways. I don't know how far it was to Nijvica there, to the train station from Belgium. I have no idea how far it was. And as we were starting on that road, my mother started holding back and holding back. There were just a few wagons with people that couldn't walk. They put them on wagons. Everybody was carrying those big bags on their shoulders, really thinking they're going to resettle us. My mother, whatever I was holding in my hand, whatever belongings I had, she threw away. She threw away whatever she carried. And she looked me straight in the face. I want you to understand, we're going to our death. There is no way. If, if anybody was had survived, because in March, so many people disappeared from Lublin and nobody, nobody knew where or what. We had a cousin, I don't know, Judy, actually, she spoke already once here. Yeah. Her sister was a very capable woman. And my mother said, if Bronya would be alive, some way, somehow, she, she would have got in touch with it. And if she's not alive, that means she's dead. And if they took away the able body to work, they taking us to our dead. She said, look at me, she said. I want you to understand. I don't believe the whole world has gone mad. There's going to be somebody somewhere that's going to help you. And you have to run because if you live, I live through you. There is no way I can leave that little boy of mine alone. To tell you the truth, I was holding him very tightly to her, to her, to her skirt. There was no way I was going to leave. But they, we were at the end. And she just forcibly pushed me off the road. And there are a few houses on top between the roads. Excuse me. And she, there was the last guard that came over to me. And he started asking me if I'm Jewish to tell you that there was blue eyes and blonde hair and I was a very skinny little thing. Uh, maybe he thought I'm Jewish. And then somebody, there must have been some farmers that were uh, riding on those horses, taking the people which couldn't walk to the train station. Somebody yelled, don't you see she's a little Polish girl? And that was the last guard. I don't much remember if my mother told me to go to the Abloinskis. She must have, but why would I go there? She must have said, go try. they decent people. Maybe they'll help you. But I don't remember much of the day because I ran maybe 18 kilometers, maybe 20. I have no idea. Until I, I arrived at his door. I knocked on the door and he let me in. And to my biggest surprise, my grandmother was there. That was a coincidence. It's really unbelievable that it actually helped me survive. I always, uh, what happened was my, my youngest, her youngest daughter, which is my youngest and my mother's youngest sister, was still in Lublin because she stayed with Mr. Tule, which was a baker that was still baking bread for the Germans. And he was my other aunt's father-in-law, you see. So he, she stayed with him and there was a Polish woman there. And the Polish woman approached her and says, you speak a perfect Polish. 
You're an intelligent woman. She was very bright, my Aunt Rose. And you don't particularly look Jewish. You have beautiful blue eyes. The only way you're going to survive, she said to her, is if you go to Germany as a Polish laborer. Because, you know, they were taking Poles to work in the factories. Yeah. But you need some papers. So my grandmother decided to beg Jabloński to give him birth certificates. That's why she came to him. And that's the day I ran away. My mother pushed me off the road. And that's the way day I met up with my grandmother at, at the Jabloński's. He wow. gave a birth certificate. Oh, yes, did you want to say something? No, I was going to ask, um, you know, how did the plant, how did you end up also going with your aunt? Because I know that's the story. That's the thing. Because that's, that's when I went, and my aunt says she would go, but she's afraid to go by herself. And she couldn't ask her sister. Her sister had small children. And the rest of the kids were too young. And I was 13. She said she'll take me. So what happened? They were looking for me. That's the day I escaped, and they were looking for me. Well, I slept that night at the Abloinsky house, little farmhouse. And I remember I was sleeping on the attic and looking out through holes, hoping that maybe my mother ran away too and she's going to show up. But she never did. The next morning, Stanislav Jablonski put me, gave me the birth certificate for my Aunt Rose because he didn't have the other ones. But he said, just take the name of my other daughter and put me, took me on a, to the train station. He put me on the train station to go to the city of Lublin to meet up with my aunt. But it's interesting. He is a Polish man that actually takes his life in his hands by helping us. And I walk into the, into the train station and all I hear is, isn't that wonderful? We're getting rid of all the Jews. Can you imagine my face when I was listening to that? Then all of a sudden I see there's standing a woman. Her name was Antosha. She used to be a girlfriend of my grandmother and I knew her well. She recognized me. She grabbed me by the shoulders, forced me against the window and says, be quiet, my child, be quiet. And that's the way I arrived in the city of Lublin walked all the way from the city station to Shiroka Street to meet up with my aunt. Shiroka Street is no sign now. I think it's all, it was all demolished. Yeah. And, and the, ne the next the day we walked out in the street and we bought two crosses. You see, I was Ruja Handelsman as, as a child. I never mentioned that name, Ruja Handelsman. Oh, okay. And then we walked to Krochmalna Ulica, where they had the Punktsbjorne, they called it, the place where all they were grabbing all kinds of poles from all over the area. They, until they had a whole big group, they sent them to Germany by train, you see. We walked in, and my aunt said she's going to freely, she's going to volunteer to go. So they said, but this one we're not going to take. She's too young. We usually take them at 16, 17, 18. She says, then I can't go, right? But they took me. It's interesting to know that I actually owe my life to three people, to three. My mother, who had the, the strength and the, the, and the mind to do what she did with me, to my Aunt Rose that took me with, and to the Abloinskis that supported us during the years when we were in Germany. And maybe also that last guard who said, can't you see this? Oh, well, he didn't say, not the guard. That was oh. a, a, a farmer, one of the, one oh. of the farmers that was taking those wagons. Oh, it wasn't a guy. So this farmer, this farmer that said that. I have no idea who he was. But, but Rose, Rose, did you both have birth certificates at this point? No, no, she had it. 
And I called myself as the name of the other girl. You see, he had three girls, Yablonski. And then, so she became Lodja Yablonska, and I became Helena Yablonska. You see? And we stayed a week there. And this was a very traumatic week for us because my aunt was 21 at the time. And her age group, and she was born in the city of Lublin, she was afraid that anybody can walk in and recognize her. That right. was big. But nobody showed up, I guess. And when they had enough Polish labor put together, they put us on a train and they took us to Germany. And you must have both spoken very good Polish. And oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I was fluent in Polish. There, there, there was no question about Polish. I had curly hair, and that was a big problem. <laughs> in my time, not many Polish girls had curly hair. It was a problem. I, uh, anyway, when we came to Germany, you have to understand that all of a sudden we had we taken on a... a completely strange identity. We had to talk about, they put me with 80 Polish girls in one house, 80. And it's an interesting phenomena. A German didn't recognize a Jew specifically, but the Polish girls recognized the Jew a mile away. So it wasn't such an easy task to pretend not to be Jew, Polish. We had to take on a completely different identity. I had to tell them stories that never happened and remember it the next day, which isn't so easy either. Let me ask you something, because you know, I told you when we first met that my yeah. mother's story has some similarities with yours. Yeah. You know, she was born in 1931 and she also survived by pretending to be Polish, Catholic, but she learned, she had to learn like, the prayers and all this stuff. Did you have some quick lessons from the Yablonskis? No, that was the only good thing about it was that when we went to church, it was a German church. Uh -huh. and, and nobody listened to nobody. Okay. That was why it was one problem. It was a problem, but slowly somehow it came to me. I was listening to somebody else, you see. But what, what, was, what was very, very hard was for me to, to remember the next day. And then how to come, oh my God, sorry. That's a fire alarm thing. And to remember what I told them the day before. And the, how do you think we communicated my, well, she, she became my sister, not my aunt anymore. She was my sister now. Mm -hmm. How do we communicate together? All we had to do is look at one another and we knew what the other one wants. You, you, there is a certain sense that develops in fear like that, you see? Yeah. Well, I, I was going to tell you that I'm going to tell that incident about walking to, to work, what happened one day. We, yeah, we all... I, I want you to tell that, but can I ask you something first? Did, the, right. Pol did the Polish girls that you were living with were... Were Jews ever a topic of conversation? Positively, every day. That that was. I, I they used to make fun of me that I have curly hair like Sudovetska, like a Polish girl, like a Jewish, girl. like a Jewish girl. Pardon me. Yeah. Okay. But what What was interesting that uh, we lived in Bremen Grown and we worked in Bremen Vegasack in a factory where they were making cords for ships. I'm oh, no, going to show, show that picture of the factory. Okay. Yeah. This is the factory, right? Yes. I don't know if that's, they, they, they found one. That's, that, it's a labor factory. They were making big strings for, for ships and from, from old cotton. They didn't have any more cotton. So they used to bring the old bales back. And this, there used to be so much dust. Oh my God. Unbelievable. We worked in such dust. So what happened that day as we were walking to work, my 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 sister Lorja and I, and two Polish girls that befriended us, very nice kids. And as we were walking to the factory, a little German boy jumped out 
and called me Polish swine, which is Polish pig. And sure enough, I got insulted. And in my, I don't know how it happened. All of a sudden, I started cursing him in Jewish. I really yeah. cursed him in Jewish. And the, the realization what I did in my end, the two of us started laughing like crazy maniacs because we, we couldn't understand how could I do a thing like that. But those Polish girls didn't understand, and the German boy ran away. And we stood there, and I want you to understand that the trauma of that moment was so severe that the next day I did not remember one Jewish word. It didn't come back to me till after the war. I couldn't speak a Jewish word. The fear of what I did was so severe. Anyway. The, they didn't treat the Poles very well either. We were hungry all the time. They gave us a piece of bread, some margarine, which I hate till today, and a piece of cheese, yellow cheese. And then every day we went to the factory and they fed us a soup made out of, oh, who knows, some veggies. I don't know what it was. Really, we, I did not see meat or fowl or fish till 1945. So, it, now, did, you, did you tell me that you had the Yablonskis send you like letters? Yes, what, had, what saved us mostly was the letters that we were receiving on a, on a steady basis. My Aunt Rose used to write to them and they used to write back and they were calling us my children, you see? Yeah. And that helped us survive. There's no question about it. I want to explain that in case someone in the audience doesn't understand that that um, if you were, it, it wouldn't make sense to not get any mail because if you, know, if you were Jewish, you didn't have any relatives that were alive, so maybe you wouldn't get any mail. So in people used to ask Christian friends to send them letters as if they were their family. Yeah. yeah. So they were sending to us, and actually many a times they send us some dry bread because we were so hungry all the time. You see, I happened to be lucky that they made me work only 12, eight hours because I was the youngest there. Everybody else worked 12 hours. Mm -hmm. So it was more, it was 20 miles from Bremen. So the bombs weren't falling that much like in Bremen, the bombing. So I used to go to a German family. I used to help her in the garden and in the house. She was actually a very nice woman. He was totally against Hitler. He, he, he yeah, he mentioned it at times. And and, and they used to give me fruit that fall, fell from the tree. And I used to come home and share it with my aunt, you see, and some bread. So it, it was a help. It was a help. I don't know how much time I have to tell you stories about this. Tell me. Well, OK, if you want. Go on. No, I don't know if, 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 if I can really, because it's going to take a lot of time and I don't know how much time I have. We have time. We have like 20 minutes. But I was going to ask you, were you in, it was in Germany where you heard mm -hmm. that the war was over, right? Oh, my God. That's, I, I want you to understand the only sign that anything was happening in the world, because we couldn't read German, so we didn't have newspapers. We couldn't, we were not allowed to listen to the radio. So we didn't hear any news. The only sign that anything was happening in the world were the American and English bombers, uh, airplanes that were flying into the cities to bomb the cities of Germany. That was the only sign that we had that maybe it's going to end one day. Uh, lies. I was, lies was the worst enemy there. I, 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 you see, I was afraid to let my hair grow curly. So I used to put it in braids so I had long hair. And at home, my mother used to wash my hair. Oh gosh, did I have a problem with those things? 
the lice were eating us up alive. Mm. Well, they let us go once a week to wash ourselves. They took us someplace to wash ourselves once a week. But everybody worked and everybody was hungry. And I found the interesting, I found the Polish men were behaving somehow a little better than the women. They didn't curse as much. I learned how to curse something awful, oh my God. I remember the time I was going with a wagon through the Polish area, to the men's area, and the wagon tilted with all the spools fell out. And I started cursing. Oh, I learned every dirty word. Wow. What else? I was at that age that I picked up every dirty word, what they said. And I started cursing. And one of the men walked over to me, took me over his knee and gave me a spanking. And he says, what's happening to our children? Wow. It's some, I never forgot that moment somehow. But listen, they were all cursing, so I was cursing. What else could I tell you? That's all. So how did you hear about the end of the war if you didn't have newspapers? Oh, well, we didn't hear the cannons we heard. Okay. We heard the cannons. They stopped feeding us. We stopped working. We didn't go to the factory anymore. The cannons were coming. So we decided to go meet our, our liberators. Uh -huh. So we took a small boat across a small river. I don't remember much. And a group of us, not only me and my aunt, but a group of the, of the other people. And we wound up in, we wound up in a camp that was mostly, it was already, the English were there already. And most of them were occupied by Belgian, from Belgium labor, forced labor from France. But as the English came into that camp, they took them on trucks and took them back to Belgium and took them back to France. So that camp was empty. And guess where we got? We got into the kitchen. Couldn't believe it. There was flour and sugar and bacon and, and fat. And we started cooking and eating and eating and cooking. And my aunt Rose almost died. Wow. Because she wasn't used to eating food anymore. She yeah. almost died. But then we still stayed in a Polish camp, in a Polish DP camp in, in uh, Bremen, because there was no transportation. I still didn't admit that I'm Jewish. I was scared to admit that. Right. And there was no transportation. I couldn't go anywhere anyway. So we stayed for quite a few months. But the United Nations fed us, and it was pure joy. Freedom was pure joy, I think. Then a cousin of my mother's knew that we were around this area, so she came looking for us, and I recognized her. Wow. And, and that's when I went to my aunt said, listen, I'll pack up. We accumulated some things. She says, she'll pack up. And why don't I take a train and go to Frankfurt am Main, Salzheim? There was a Jewish DP camp there. So that's when I went on the train to go to the Jewish DP camp. And when I walked in, I didn't realize that that section was for Jewish people that were coming from Poland. It was reserved for them. And the minute I stayed there, there was a Polish young man too, talking to me. They realized that I was talking Polish and they had a lot of trouble on the border. And they were so mad at the Poles. They said, there is a Polish girl, we don't want to out with her. The Polish gentleman walked out, but I wasn't gonna walk out. The first time I'm meeting Jewish people, they're gonna throw me out. There was no way I was going out. Then the, the man that was running that group felt kind of sorry for me and says, leave the kid alone. She says she's Jewish. Maybe she is. Talk Jewish. I couldn't. You see, I couldn't say a word. But when they started asking me about the Jewish holiday, I had no problem. I told them all about the Jewish holiday. And interesting enough, when I walked out in Frankfurt am Main from the station, I heard one say to the other, she must have been a maid in a Jewish home. They still 
did not believe me. I guess from the age of 13 till 16, you, you time develop and I really totally became poor, <laughs> yes. Mm. So and then I went to Zaltzheim. And but tell, tell me a little, because like one of the most interesting things for me about my mother's story is the feeling she had about taking on this even, whole... You can't even imagine. Okay. You're talking about freedom, right? No, I'm talking about um, guilt or um, something about, about taking on the Polish identity, you know? about so inhabiting like pretending that you're not Jewish like did you have any oh well, absolutely I was absolutely more Polish than I was Jewish there's no question about it at the time you know but I did come back and I guess I'm I'm a kind of a person that adjusts very easily I suppose I'm lucky that way yeah yeah and you see my aunt from Russia came back you see she survived she had a little boy there, was just born in Russia. She and her husband came and she said, listen, you're my, you're my sister's daughter, you're going to be my daughter, right? And my Aunt Rose met up with, with a nice gentleman and she got married. And I said, no, I'm not going to be anybody's daughter. I'm going to Israel. I became a Zionist, absolutely full. There, there was nothing to talk about. Wait, wait, was this straight from Germany? Did you return to Poland or you didn't? No, I never returned to Poland. There was no need to. I knew that nobody was alive already. We knew that. So, I, my Aunt Rose went to the United States. My Aunt Bella went to the United States. My cousin Judy went to the United States. Rose went to Israel. Not to go to Israel. You couldn't go to Israel. Israel was not a state yet. Oh my God, I didn't even know that. Okay, We're, you're so interesting, nobody's listening to that. <laughs> you know what happened? They put us, they took me to Austria and then they made me walk the Alps in the middle of February. Oh, please don't ever try it. The snow was up to here. We walk the Alps. We are wound up in Italy. And then in Italy, they took me to a place, Avigliano Profturina, Vilda Santa Agostina, I remember. I stayed there for a year, actually. But with a whole group of young people that came back from Russia or from the woods, like my, my husband survived in a hole in the ground in the Ukraine. Mm. So that's where I met my husband-to-be. In, in the Italy, and it was a good year for me, because what happened was there, the United Nations was keeping us, and there was a group of teachers that started teaching us. You have to remember that in 1939, that was the end of my school. Right. So they started teaching us. They te taught me Hebrew. They taught me Hebrew. And they taught me about history and a little math. I got a little education that year that I spent in Italy. What language were they teaching you in? Oh, Hebrew when we were talking Polish or Jewish. I, I knew how to speak Jewish already. I learned how to come back. Then I forgot German completely because I spoke German fluently for a while. Wow. Anyway, so... And Hebrew, they taught me Hebrew. Actually, when I arrived in Israel, I spoke Hebrew already, you see. And then one day they took us and they took us to Venice and they put us on a small boat, 300 people. They stuck us together like herring, I bet you. <laughs> oh my God. And we were three weeks on the Mediterranean Sea trying to get into Israel illegally. Surprise, surprise. When we, we came close to the Israeli border, two big English ships, but big, you should have seen it, warships. And, and we were in that little, little fishing boat. Wow. Those two big ships surrounded us. They started jumping up to, to, to that little boat, like we were going to try and fight them, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting enough that the English 
that liberated me in 1945, incarcerated me the beginning, and the 47 was, or beginning of 48, I don't remember exactly. The same English that liberated me, incarcerated me, and took me to Cyprus, an island in the Mediterranean Sea. I stayed there for three months, and then I legally got into Israel. Mm. Just exactly when the 1948 War of Liberation started. I had that one too. Interesting. Now, Rose, yes. we have a few um, pictures okay. from after the war. I don't okay, know. If that's my Aunt Rose and I in Zaltzheim. Okay. And that's Italy. And I was in Italy. Those two pictures. My husband, you can see. This is, it says your husband and you in Israel in 48 here. Oh, that's, oh, that was Israel already? Maybe, but not, this one was in Italy, so they put it wrong. I remember it was in Italy. Here's a picture of you and your husband getting when we married. Got married. We got married in 1949 in Israel. Oh my, my gosh, yeah. That's my crazy. husband was a good looking young man, was he? Yeah. He survived in the Ukraine. <laughs> so you get to Israel and then, you know, did you have any thought in your head that you would ever go back to Poland or it just no, wasn't even? No, that was the, the farthest thought from my mind. I knew there was nothing to go back to. Nothing to go back to. So everybody Israel for a few years? Well, I never did mention that my mother died in Sobibor that day. Yeah. They went to Sobibor. Nobody survived. Yes, dear. What were you asking? Um, I was asking if, did you live in Israel for a while before you went to Canada? Or? Four and a half years. Mm -hmm. But the climate absolutely didn't. The times were very tough in those years. And the climate did not agree with me at all. Mm. I was married and a doctor told me I'll never carry a child out. I used to develop kidney stones from the heat. And my Aunt Rose and my Aunt Bella, they were in the States and they wanted to bring me to the States. But the quota was very high. Mm. So they found some relatives in Canada and, and they, they got me to come to Canada. They paid my way to go to Canada. And I have to say, from the first day that I arrived here, I love this country. It's, wow. I really do, in all honesty. It's given me freedom and, and I could live in peace and I could bring up children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. And I'm very, very grateful to this country for letting me in and letting me live in peace and tranquility. I have to say that. It's very important for me. I tell it. I tell it to my students when I speak to them. Always. So let's let's fast forward because I I'm going to give a spoiler here. But you know, you eventually did go to Poland. <laughs> so oh, tell, tell no me, how did that come about? How did you? Well, end up no, first time I went to Poland was 25 years ago because I was trying to. I didn't do anything what I should have done to, to honor the Yablonskis before. I don't know. The years just went by. And 25 years ago, I started searching. I wanted to find somebody. So I, I sent some letters to the to Novini uh, magistrate. And they actually notified me about Helena. She was still alive at the time. And we all traveled to Poland, but for some reason, she didn't tell me about all the other family. I don't know why, what was the reason? I don't want to get into that. But and I corresponded to it for a long time. And then all of a sudden the letters stopped coming and that was it. I lost contact with her. Absolutely, she died. I called her my husband. He answered me the phone, he told me she died, and her daughter died that was living with her that I met. 
So when we went with with to the Brahma Grotska, actually, it was arranged. Ruti Josephs, my cousin, arranged 30 some of us to go to, to Poland, right? Yeah, and we had, our, let me just explain that the Brahma Grotska organized a reunion of um descendants of Lublin Jews and Lublin Jews like you. And yeah. that was in the summer of 2017. So for five days it was many yeah. people together. Yeah. So we went and then what happened there is a Polish reporter found me and she she was holding a mic all the time and wherever I went she went. She took me all over the place. And then she did a documentary on me. I spoke in Polish. And I was talking about the Yabloinsky, and then it opened up. Everybody started calling me. Anina from 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 New Jersey. They all found out that I look that the Yabloinskis helped me. You see? Yeah. So explain who Yanina is um, for the. Yanina audience. is a granddaughter of Stanislav Yabloinsky, and she lives in in New Jersey. You see? Yeah, and I think. So, it her sister heard on the radio, heard this documentary on the radio or something? Yeah, they, the whole family heard. They heard it on the radio. And I was notified. To, I remember I put it through the third degree. I wanted to make sure <laughs> who she is. Yeah. And, and she came to visit here to me. And it was that was the day that actually they on YouTube, there's over four million people watched it already. And I that the there was a reporter here from the National Post in Toronto that came to see what was happening. She came, and from the minute she opened the door, I felt such warm toward her. And she toward me like we would have known each other all our lives. Wow. Oh, so then I aggressively started working on to get on it, to get uh, put Stanislav and Maria Blonsky as as a righteous among nations and it, we were supposed to have the ceremony two years ago coronavirus came so we couldn't go so maybe this spring we're trying to see if we can have the ceremony because they were approved by by how do you call it by Yad Vashem okay those are my three children wait I want it where is oh this is the Yablonsky family, family right yeah yeah so this is Stanislav, obviously. Yeah, and that's Maria. Maria, okay. Um, and then, oh, your yeah, your family. These are your that's children, right? My children. That's Alan, Carol, and Linda. Okay, and then we have also your husband and you. Uh, yeah, we were traveling at that time, but I've I've been a widow for twenty years already. It's been a long time. Mm. Well, that's when I, oh, that's when we met. Oh, then I I was on a documentary. Anybody interested in seeing it? The name of it is Cheating Hitler. And that was the opening of the documentary. And Janina came to see it. Oh, and we were here together. You see, that's Janina. Yeah. Um. Oh, this is this is my grown three children, my son and my two daughters, and me. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and those are my five granddaughters and two great grandchildren. But I have two more now: another little girl and a little boy. You have to update the photo. <laughs> yes, I will. I will. And then, oh, that's when we went to Oslo. It's the time when we went. When, when it was that reunion. Yeah. So, Rose, um, I think we did pretty well with time because it's just almost three o'clock now. Yeah. So I'm going to look at the questions. Okay. Actually, one of the questions you already answered because um, Samantha Rodriguez was asking if the Yablonsky family was recognized as righteous among yeah. the nations. Yeah, but we couldn't do the ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then her mother, Alejandra, asked, when did you stop fearing to declare that you were Jewish after the war? Did it take a long time to stop that fear? Well, honey, 
I was quite a few months after the war with the Polish people, never admitted. I waited till I came to the Jewish area that I was with my own people. It, it wasn't easy. Yeah. It wasn't easy. I'm curious because um, my mother actually used, she was named Krisha as a mm -hmm. Catholic girl. And she used this name for like seven years until they came to the United States in 52. She kept using the name Krisha. So I'm curious about you. No, I changed it the minute I got to Zaltzab. I became okay. Ruja again. <laughs> The minute okay. I got into my in, into my own environment, yeah. So tell me when you went for the reunion um, to Lublin, and people yes. who are listening, please feel free to add more questions. Um, did you, you know, did did you have trepidation about going to Poland? Like, what were your feelings about? It was, it was already the second time. I told you I went twenty five. Right years ago. Yeah. I have to say something. 25 years ago, when I went with my husband and two of my children, my youngest was expecting a baby. She couldn't come. And what happened was I could more sense more anti-Semitism still. I could feel I somebody approached my son, Jew, because we were going into a Jewish cemetery. And you said, Jew, get out of here. And my son really stood up to him. I was scared they're going to they're gonna be, have a fight there. I did feel it still. Well, much less when I came to the reunion. All of a sudden, the younger people are completely different. They have a different outlook. And it, it, it warms my heart because no matter what you say, I feel for the Polish people. I was a Pole for three years. And, and and it stays with you. You know what I mean? It stays with you. I can and, and a Polish man saved my life. So I can't feel that, you see. But I don't talk about hatred to the children that I speak in schools because I tell them it's it's an emotion that they should keep away because it only hurts you. It doesn't do any good. And I'm trying to be put a positive. About 18 years ago, I started speaking in schools all over uh, Canada. You see, they come to the Holocaust Center, the children, groups of children, mm -hmm. and I talk to them. And and I find a very good response I get. Uh, one little girl, yeah. Yeah. So okay. Somebody is asking if you know a sm small town called Dratu? Correct. Well, Dratuf, it looks like. Is it in the, Pol in the Lublin area? Oh, I see that somebody answered it already. Maybe they were asking somebody in the chat. I'm sorry. Um, let me see. Um, yeah. How do you remember um, Sheroka Street? Because you mentioned Sheroka, and this is like, one of the iconic streets of Jewish Lublin. My mother was oh, yeah. there, my grandmother, I mean, other people on this. On this. And he wants a few more streets, I can tell him. I remember streets. But you know how you were talking about like sounds are very salient for you. You remember, yeah. are there any sounds from Sheroka Street or smells or? No, uh, it smells is from the bubalist. You know, and and there's smells from the tune that I used to carry when my mother put it in on Friday to the bakery, and I picked it up on Saturday morning and carried it home. That you smell. Know, you know this. what? That is a really interesting phenomenon that I don't think everybody knows about. This first of all, explain what cholent is, mm -hmm. and then explain this what the Jews used to do. You know, on Friday. Yeah. On Friday night, you. My mother cut potatoes and put some meat in and some barley and some beans and covered it up absolutely good. And then there was the newspapers were always covered. I couldn't remember why the newspapers were there. And we used to take it to a bakery, which the ovens, we kept it there till the next day at 12 o'clock. Because and you couldn't turn your oven on because it was Shabbat. It wasn't that right? A, that's right. Although our home wasn't very religious, but it was an easy way of not to have to cook on a Saturday, you see? Okay. So, so, you know, there's smells and memories, smells and memories of 
of Passover every year that my mother used to, you know, my father had a few people that worked for him in that little in that little shop. And, and she used to cook a red borscht and potatoes the day before Passover evening. Why do I remember that? I don't know. I can still smell it. Mm. Yeah. I know, I know there is, oh my God, I was going to tell you another story about that. I don't remember. Do, do you, you know, people think of Sheroka Street like as the heart of Jewish Lublin. Do you? Well, Sheroka Street was a, Actually, when you went down, you know where the, where the parking lot is now? Mm -hmm. And used, the cobblestones used to be a little hill. It was a hill. And then you went down, and there was Sheroka Street. You see, uh, Sheroka, Kowalska is still there. Kowalska Street is still there. Ribna is still there. Grotska is still there. The Jewish area around the Zamek is all gone. You see, yeah. they used, they used so because you know, yeah. my aunt had a wedding there. My 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 aunt Bella got married on that on that little street. Oh gosh, I remember the wedding. Do you remember? Wrote, well, I, let me just explain for people that aren't as familiar with Lublin that there yeah. was this um, very concentrated Jewish center under the castle. Um, Zamek is castle, and Shadow yeah, Street was a main. Some cover. I yeah. know. That's where the I'm wedding not, was. Yeah, I'm not telling you. I'm telling for the audience. <laughs> um, and then that whole area was destroyed. Like after the, the people were murdered, then they destroyed streets and that houses. It was in 1942. Yeah. In, yeah. The, in the spring of 1942. And, and there was a great synagogue that was also destroyed. Do you have any memories of that? Did you go to there was a, We used to go on Sheroka Street to a synagogue, I think. I don't remember where my father used to, my mother used to go. Do you remember that big building, though, the, the Maharaj? Well, which, which street was it? Do you, do you know? I mean, I don't know. Agata can write to me. Oh, Yatechna. Oh, no. I don't, I don't remember. All I know is a, a brother of my father used to, on Jewish High Holiday, used to help them sing because he had that beautiful singing voice. Oh, I remember Saskia Ogrut. I don't know if anybody knows where this is. At the end of... It's a at park. At the end of Kukowski, the big park, Saskia yeah. Ogrut. My, my, my cousin, my father's sister's girl, she was all much older than me. She used to take me there. Um, Rose, how did your, you know, you said you came with 30 people to the reunion, a yes. big family group. Um, yeah. How, what were the kinds of reactions that people of the different generations had, you know? And Well, me and Judy were the two adults that knew anything, right? Yeah. All the others are second generation and third generation, you see? all the others. So they surrounded us, me and Judy. We were trying to show him where this one lived, where this one lived, because my whole family lived in Lublin, you see. Yeah. So many different streets. They lived on Lubatowska, they lived on Nova, they lived on Świętoduska, they, I mean, on Grotska, all over. So do you think that the your kids and your grandchildren were, were very interested in well, my, my three of my grandchildren went with me when I did the documentary. We went to Sobibor. We actually went to Sobibor. Oh my God, this was the hardest part. When my grandchildren, when we went, we went to Sobibor. When, I, when my daughter went with me, she was with the group when we went to, to, cel the, uh, to celebrate that. The thirty people. My my youngest daughter was with me. Um, and I, it seems to me, you know, Rose, you have such a positive attitude, which you you um, said that your mother kind of instilled that in you. you well, know? she left me. She left me a legacy. If she could, in the face of death, still believe in the human race, so how can I not? Yeah, it's really it's really an incredible legacy. Because she was, 
she was quite a woman and i i i hope i'm more my my mother's daughter than i think i hope <laughs> i think you very much are and you're very much you know despite this extremely painful history yeah. And managing to project um, a positive attitude and an optimistic attitude is such a gift for all of us. So, Rose, thank you so much. I have much. a beautiful family. I didn't even talk about my beautiful family. We saw some pictures, but if you want, if. if well, I have uh, my my oldest son used to be an accountant, but he's not, he's retired now. Gosh, I got children who are of age to retire. <laughs> my middle daughter was a professor, actually a doctor of education. My youngest is a lawyer, but works for the Children's Aid Society. Some of my grandchildren, I have a social worker, I have a doctor, I have going to have an, another teacher, I have one teacher. So they all done very well. Thank That's God. Great. And they're good people, decent people, working, hardworking people. So I'm very thankful. Yeah. And I sure really yeah. appreciate it. And, and you know what? And my granddaughters actually like me, and that's a nice kind of feeling. <laughs> well, Rose, I like you too. And I'm sure that a lot of people watching this also feel the same way. So thank you so much for joining us today. No more questions? No more questions? No, I think we're going to end because I have to do some like announcements and stuff. But I okay. thank you so much. And thank you to Linda, one of those wonderful children of yours, for her help with the technical things and the photos and everything. And um, I want to also, of course, thank Agata, who's doing everything behind the scenes and, um, and uh, the audience. Thank you so much to everyone, whether you're with us live today or you're watching on youtube later um thanks for joining and i know you'll agree with me that rose is a very special person um mm. so a few announcements uh our next brahma talks we are going to be taking um a, it easy a little bit in the summer so instead of having a july and an august we're going to have one meeting on august 5th and it's going to be, I'm really excited about it. It's going to be with um, Samantha Rodriguez and Alejandra, Alejandra Del Rio. They're a mother and daughter from Mexico who discovered their Jewish Lublin roots. Their family is from Mianzizic, which is in the Lublin region. And they're going to be, what? Medvisa, you said? No, Mianzizic. It's my, it's my pronunciation. Um, mm -hmm. um, and um, they're going to tell us the story of their, their exciting discovery about this Jewish family, but also the tragedy that befell a lot of members of the family. And another part of what we're going to talk about is Samantha, who's only 20 years old, who I also met at the reunion. Um, she, for the last year, has been doing a really great project called The Voice of the Silence, which is about bringing awareness of the Holocaust to younger generations in English and in Spanish. So please, everybody, come to that. And um, the way that we tell you now about Brahma Talks is through our English newsletter, which is new of the, um, since the last few months. So um, when you, you know, please sign up for that so you can hear about Brahma Talks. Um, and finally, I want to encourage anyone who is listening who is has Lublin Jewish roots to fill out the survey, which also comes in the newsletter. It's conducted by Dvora Trachtenberg, who is a Lubliner herself. Her parents are from Lublin. In fact, her mother, her aunt was a beloved teacher of my mother. Um, and um, it's called Our Lublin Jewish Roots, What Do They Mean to Us? And it's, it's you know, not only a good idea to fill it out so Dvorah has more material, but I think it's interesting. I don't know if you've done it, Rose, but um, there's some interesting questions that she asked there, you know, so it's it's like thought provoking. So um, that's all I have for today. So thanks, everybody, and see you next time. Thank you, Thank Rose. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> You're all well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.